Welcome back to the KO Convo. And um, I got I got a good guest for you today, ladies and gentlemen. Got to be one of the most interesting 23-year-olds on the entire planet. Uh, my former tennis teammate at Ohio was in Aaron Bennington, but as you'll so soon learn, he's uh, a lot more than a lot more than just a, a student athlete at Ohio was in a former student athlete at Ohio was in Aaron. How are you? Pretty good. How you doing, Ken? Good, good. So, man, you've been all over the place. I, I, I don't know what it is, yeah. but I just want to start it off. I mean, you reached million miler status with American American Airlines at 22 years old, and for. A lot of people where did this show they're still trying to figure out what the hell they're doing at 22 years old. Uh, just talk about where that um, uh, travel interest came from and and what really got you to push to that goal of of a million miles. I uh, I honestly have no clue. I actually never had the goal of hitting million miles, so to say. Um, I just had the goal to travel and see the world, and it just happened along the way. Um, I never, like, I've never traveled really growing up as, uh, with my family. I mean, they took us on vacations every now and then, but I don't think we, I think we may have flown somewhere maybe one or two times, um, growing up. We like went to North Carolina, just the typical family vacations from Ohio. Um, but when I started working for, uh, this company, when I was incredibly young, I was about 13, 14 years old, uh, I knew there was international travel opportunities. And, uh, I always had like the goal set, um, in the back of my mind to like reach that at some point. And uh, by the time I was 15, I got the opportunity to go to Ecuador. And uh, once I, I touched, touched soil in a foreign country for the first time, I just caught the bug. And I just uh, continued wanting to explore and to see more of the world. Yeah, no kidding. And, and you've been so many places. What's your favorite place you've been so far, if you had to choose one? I know there's a lot. Yeah, I feel like I get that question so often. And I really like never really know how to how to answer that um, but I always say Thailand um, Thailand just has like such a great diverse uh, offering of things like good food incredibly nice people they have like in the mountains up uh, up by Chiang Mai like beautiful landscapes um, then you go down to like the south by Phuket and stuff and you have amazing beaches so it just has a it has a good mix of things yeah uh, all that apart from the food poisoning right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I definitely did get food poisoning with another one of the OU tennis uh, teammates wrong. I ate some questionable food on the way home from the bars one time, and uh, I thought I was going to die that night. <laughs> yeah, well, um, it, it seems, though, as you're traveling, you're obviously have had this very, uh, very determined fitness mindset, I'll say. I mean, you've you ran your first marathon in, in Israel. You ran through the 50 plus miles through the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. You just did your first Ironman in Mexico and are now training uh, for another one in New Zealand. So, uh, just talk to me about your enjoyment just doing those things or, or is it to really just push yourself to be the best you can be or is there something like, oh yes, this is going to get me in the best shape as possible or, or a mix of both? Um. I feel like it definitely in the back of my mind, I want to do it to stay in good shape, uh, especially like after college, um, like in college, we were playing tennis all the time and uh, I was just staying in shape that way. Um, after college, I knew I needed to find something, uh, but it's definitely not like the biggest reason. Um, I felt like the biggest reason for me is that um, I, I feel like you never discover your full potential until you test your potential. Um, so I'm continuously trying to test my potential and uh, I'd still apparently haven't found it um uh, I, I actually went into uh like during that 50 mile race in Colorado um I messed up my knee I can't remember the exact medical term but it's when your kneecap slides to the side um and then it goes bone on bone with your uh it's your patella against the other big bone in your in your leg and uh, that happened in mile 30 and then I ran 20 more miles on that and it was like in, like intense pain but um I found that when you go through that type of pain um, and when you intentionally put yourself through that, that type of pain, uh, when you return home and you return to your like normal daily tasks and stuff, everything becomes incredibly easy. Um, so I, I don't know if I enjoy it, so to say, um, like I definitely did not enjoy the last 20 miles of that 50 miler. Um, but when just knowing that your body can do that and knowing the pain that you can endure just makes everything else in life so much easier. 
Yeah. Well, what was the point of that? Uh, of that Iron Man in Mexico, where you where you uh, where you felt your body sort of not giving up on you, so to speak, but really having to have that mental strength to really to really go through it all. Yeah. So um, I. I don't even know, like, I just became obsessed with the idea of doing an Ironman. Um, and unfortunately with like 2020, um, it's just keep getting pushed back and pushed back. Um, so I, I got a half Ironman in, um, last year and I actually, I did a sprint tri- or a Olympic triathlon, um, back in January of last year. And uh, at that point I didn't know how to swim. Um, so I doggy paddled the whole way through and, uh, barely made it through without drowning. Uh, but, I did the Ironman in Mexico and uh, Cozumel. I've just always loved Mexico. I wanted to go down there. So um, did that, but um, I wasn't prepared for the heat. Uh, I was training in like 60 degree Ohio weather and then it's 90, 95 in the afternoon once you hit the run portion down there. And when you hit that run portion after you swim 1.2 miles and bike 56 miles, um, you just, you're in a state that your body has never been in before. And uh, there was points during that run where it was just absolutely horrible. Like the, the pain and the mental pain of pushing myself through it. But um, at the end of the day, like it prepared me more for future events. Um, and I'm definitely glad I did it. Yeah. So is that, uh, is that New Zealand one still planning to go, go on as planned? So you're still preparing for that one? Yeah, I'm still preparing as of now. Um, I feel like the chances of me actually being able to do it are about 10%. Uh, New Zealand's still completely closed. They haven't canceled the race yet. Um, but I literally this morning, I got a, a notification from uh, Fiji Airways that my flight got canceled. So I'm trying to find different forms to get over there and trying to work out, like work around. Um, there is a possible way I could go over there and do it a 14 day quarantine before the race. Um, so that's probably my only option. But uh, if not, I can defer the race to one in, uh, there's one in Australia in June, but I'll probably do if this, if I'm not able to do this one. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, ha- so in preparing for this, have, are you preparing this uh, the same way you did for that Mexico one? Or is it a little different training process? To be honest, I, I didn't really train much for the Mexico one. Um, the Mexico one, I, 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 I did, I've done a lot of stuff cold turkey. Like I ran my first marathon with never running more than eight miles. Um, I did it. I drank the night before. Um, it just wasn't, I just didn't prepare as I should have. And, uh, I had a goal in my mind of a four hour marathon and it, I hit it. I got 3:59, and, uh, the flight home the next day, like I was in incredible amount of pain. My legs were twitching, uh, just wasn't good. But now that I'm like getting up in distances, like for a hundred mile or for Ironman, like I definitely want to prepare myself more. So like now I'm doing about a thousand to 1500 yards in the pool a day. Um, and then usually like a 45 minute bike ride a day. And then between like four to five, four to six miles a day running. Damn, that's, that's, that's pretty intense. Uh, <laughs> so I do kind of want to switch gears real fast completely. And yeah. something that we've, we've briefly talked about um, is your huge involvement with the, with the, uh, with the whole paintball circuit, right? And you now are owner mm-hmm. of your of your own league. I think it's the Mid South League. I think that's what it's called. Yeah, um, Mid South Expo League. Yeah, Mid South Expo League. How did how did your how how did this involvement in in paintball of all sports really come to be? And and how have you been able to really uh, be in it for this long? So I began playing, um, I began playing when I was about eight to nine years old. And uh, by the time I was about 11, 12, I was playing tournaments around this like region. Um, by the time I was 13, I was playing the PSB series at the time, which was uh, all over the country. Um, so like, we had an event out in California or Phoenix at the time, um, Florida, just all over. Um, and then it, being a 13, 14 year old traveling the States, I just didn't have the money. So it just wasn't feasible, it wasn't sustainable. Um, so I got offered a job refereeing paintball and I took it and ended up really liking it. I got to see, be around all my friends, travel and get paid. Um, so it was a pretty unique opportunity and it paid pretty good, especially for my age. Um, so I stuck with that. I quit playing and I did that for uh, about from the time I was 13 until the time I was about 18. 
Um, and then uh, after that, I started transitioning into doing construction of events. Um, and then I also started doing like management more. Um, and the way I got the league that I currently own is that I used to work for the league and the current owner, it was just eating up too much of his time. He owns like four other businesses. Um, and I was doing essentially like everything, like uh, as far as staffing goes for him and he offered it to me. He did owner financing and uh, I, I bought it from him back in 2018. So that was when I was a sophomore in college. Um, I've been running it since. Very cool. Very cool. And it seems like paintball, uh, obviously, since it's grown a lot since you started playing, but just in the last couple of years, it seems like the, the sport has really blossomed into something people are like, oh, yeah, this is like legit. Yeah, I think. I think it's more of, it's like a resurgence um, because it used to be like it is now back in like 2008, um, right when I was kind of just getting into it. And then it definitely fell, it, it dropped back a lot. And then it's it's been starting to grow since about 2015, 2016, quite a bit. Um, and I think we're on a little bit of a downturn right now, but I think most of that's just because of COVID. Um, but I also, this year we saw a big uptick uh, or this past year, we saw a big uptake in recreational players. Um, and we just think it's because like everything is closed. So like paintball is always on people's minds, but it's always their like fourth or fifth option. And now that their first, second, and third options are closed, they're going to play paintball. So there's been a, a large uptick in uh, recreational paintball players in the U.S. this year. Yeah. How were you guys able to kind of once the but once the uh, pandemic hit, how were you guys able to what was your like uh companies or I guess company like what was your reaction in terms of still having these events were you still able to have events things of that nature uh, I was definitely freaking out at the beginning because uh, we were told by the state of Kentucky we had to cancel the first event so we canceled the first event um, I refunded all the entry fees um, which was a huge hit on my part um, and I mean, we lost a lot of money the first quarter of last year, and we finally were able to start the season off in June. So we typically start in March. Um, so usually we have two events by June and we were able to start in June. Um, June, it had to be a modified event where we were limited at the amount of people on site, with 200 people on site. And we typically have about 400 people. So we had to split the event into two days or two weekends. Um, which was really costly. Um, so we lost in a lot of money in the first half of the year. Um, and the second half of the year is kind of as normal, but uh, it still was just crawling out of a hole from the first half of the year. Yeah. I mean, every, everyone was hit extremely hard, yeah. uh, but I mean, the sports most, obviously some of the major sports were able to continue what they were doing, but um, do you see a time where paintball is uh where paintball gets that national recognition, such as some of these bigger sports like baseball, football, all those things? Um, I feel like it's a tough question um, just because it's hard to compare to baseball and football and stuff like that. Um, I do think it will get national rec recognition, but I don't think it will be as big as baseball or football. Um, I think it might be something like, um, like the X Games. Um, it's got like a great potential for that or like BMX racing. You see that on TV every now and now, now and then, but uh, I don't think it's one of those things where it'll ever be like a prime time Friday night show. Um, but it's definitely in the works to be on TV um, this coming year and uh, it'll be early 2022. Uh, we actually have an event that's going to be televised. Um, it's going to be called the super cup. So it's basically the winners of every event throughout the course of 2021 um, throughout the United States, Latin America, Europe, and Asia. Um, they'll meet together and it'll be a smaller event with just the winners. And then that event will be televised. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, if, if cornhole, if cornhole, the cornhole championships can get on ESPN too, I'm sure, I'm sure the paintball I championships. Know, I saw that. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure the paintball championships <laughs> can, can get on ESPN as well. Um, going back to kind of your lifestyle thing, what is your approach on, on life been like? Because you've, you've traveled so much, you've done so many different things and you kind of touched on it in the beginning, but just kind of bringing it back to what your mindset on life really is. Yeah. I just think, um, I don't know. I think my mindset on life kind of stems back, uh, back when I was 14, I uh, was in a pretty bad car accident and I definitely probably should have died. 
And uh, since then, I have always had the mindset that um, someone gave me whatever it is, higher power, uh, gave me a second chance of life. So I can't mess it up. So I, I always have this uh, idea that I should never be doing mindless activities. Like if I have spare time, I should be um, either doing something good for my health as far as working out or do, do something good as my mind as just increasing my knowledge um, or something productive work wise or around the house or whatever. So I, I try to fill all of my time by doing that. Like even when I'm on the bike here in the house, like I'm either like watching videos or I'm reading a book or something. Um, so I just try to make the most out of my time. You can't get bored, can you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're not a good. I also uh, adding on to that. I also have had a. Um, yeah, I it kind of came to me like the last year or two, um, but I, I just I, I've always thought um, like personally, um, I've I've lived an incredible life, um, and one of my things is that I'm I'm not scared to die, which sounds kind of morbid. Uh, but the reason being that I'm not scared to die is because like I've lived an, an incredible life. Like I've lived a life uh, subjectively probably better than what a lot of people will. Um, and if my time comes tomorrow, my time comes tomorrow and I, I will be very thankful for the life I have. Um, but I think that's also opened the doors for me to uh, live a little more and risk a little more. Um, so I, I think that's definitely push me past my comfort zone in a lot of things I do uh, because like we aren't guaranteed the next day so uh, and I I feel like my happiness has increased uh, tenfold since I've done that just because I, I don't have any regrets like I I do things and I don't I don't worry about them as much as I used to uh, and I just enjoy them more so uh, that's I I'm taking on a new uh, thing coming this coming month I'm getting my skydiving license so I'm going out to Arizona and doing 25 jumps in a week so Jeez, yeah that's, i mean uh, that's my next, like yeah i mean tipping. <laughs> <laughs> i mean i've been skydiving too and to be honest that was that was one of those things because i have like a big fear of heights but that was one of those things where i was like the calmest which is sounds weird yeah. um but i mean god that was such an amazing experience so kudos to you my man because i uh, i might want to do it uh at some point just not now um but uh, yeah, uh <laughs> f final question where where uh where are you traveling to next internationally what do you want what's the next big trip for aaron bennington so i don't know if you saw but uh two days ago the u.s just required covid tests for any international arriving passenger even u.s uh, citizens so um my my plans are a little bleak right now um i i was supposed to go to guatemala uh, but I was doing research on like where I could get a uh, COVID test once I get to Guatemala and it's like very expensive or it's very hard to get an appointment. Um, so that trip got canceled. But um, currently I'm, I'm going to Phoenix um, at the end of this month for like about a week and a half to do, get my skydiving license. Um, and then after that, um, the only tra trip I've planned is to New Zealand, which uh, doesn't look too good either. So um, I'm probably going to stay stateside for a while. But uh, if I get the chance to sneak away to the Caribbean or, or some new country, I definitely will. Yeah, back to, back to Cabo. There's always Cabo for you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, well I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people understand how I, I still think Mexico is really underrated as a travel destination. Oh, absolutely. I always say uh, Mexico is uh, probably the most underrated country that I've been to. And it's unfortunate because most people that uh, we know have only been to like Cabo or like Cancun or Cozumel or whatever. Um, but there's so much to see. Like uh, I went to the state in the south of uh, Mexico called Chiapas and there's like it borders Guatemala and it, it just beautiful waterfalls like insane um uh blue like just random like ponds in the middle of nowhere that are crystal clear blue um that with waterfalls going down them um great hiking and then like you can go up like up by Mexico City is incredible there's um the pyramids Teotihuacan just absolutely yeah. incredible so much history yeah. there um, and I wish more people would like explore the less touristy parts of Mexico because there's so much to see. 
Yeah, yeah. And even in those little uh, rural parts, like you got Puebla, Cholula, you know, Tequanipa and mm-hmm. stuff like those. And then you got beautiful cenotes all around the country. It's just we, we, we could yeah. talk about this. Uh, this is a whole nother episode. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, but uh, Aaron Bennington, I know you're a busy, busy man, and, and it's always a good catching up with former teammates. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the KO Convo, my man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Keenan. It's nice talking to you. Thank you.